and then welcome to the last day of KubeCon, and thank you for coming. Um, today, we will, we will talk about the next log for shell and then how can we prepare for the CVs with the help of eVPF. So, who is speaking today? My name is Natalia Ivanko. I'm a security product lead at Isovalent, and here is with me John, who is um, a staff software engineer, Tetragon lead, and then a Cilium maintainer at Isovalent. So, a little bit about the agenda. So, we will start with a motivation like a quick recap, like what is log for shell just in a one-on-one, -on -one because I'm not a Java developer, so I cannot really go in very details. And then we will see like why eBPF would be the optimal solution to detect that. We will see an open source tool, um, Tetragon, and then we will deep dive into how this uh, solution would pick up log for shell and then we will show a demo. And then I will finish with some further detection and then prevention techniques like how could we do uh, detect the next log for shell? Because there will be many more coming. So let's start with a quick 101. So what is log for shell? It's actually a vulnerability in a Java logging library, which is licensed by Apache 2, and then it allows remote code execution. So basically, the attacker who could control the log messages um, that are going into an application and then is vulnerable, um, the attacker would be able to execute um, arbitrary code loaded. And then, of course, it affects a wide range of products, servers, and vendors. So why is it happening? Uh, why this vulnerability actually exists? So it's actually due to three features, bugs, whatever you want to call it. And then two of them is in actually Log4j, and then the third is actually a Java feature. So the first one is um, the Log4j library allows you to log uh, messages from sources that you actually don't control. So for example, if you're receiving uh, data in your application, it allows you to log, for example, usernames, passwords, or error codes, return codes, and so on. The second one is it also allows you to log, for example, environment variables. So if you do like dollar sign, curly base, Java version, curly base, it will, of course, log the Java version. You could do, for example, OS version, and then it would actually log the OS version. And then what it, what's interesting that it allows you to do that recursively. So is, if the Java version actually that string contains under dollar sign curl base, something, something curl base, it will actually resolve, uh, resolve that and log that as well. And then the third one, G, the GNDA feature, it's actually a Java feature. So what it does, it allows you to look up information on other servers. So for example, you could do like DNS lookups, you could do like LDAP lookups, and then you can actually put like an LDAP server address, and then basically what Log4j will do, it will connect to that server, look up that information, basically return back, and then basically log uh, what was looked up. And then what's interesting, that you can actually return with a Java object. So for example, if that information on the LDAP server was actually a Java object, Basically, log4j will uh, return with a Java object, and then it will happily run. So for example, if I'm like a crafty individual, I can like set up my LDAP server, put my Java object finder, and then send that string to a vulnerable log4j application. So what would happen then? So let's say I'm an attacker. I figured out that there is like vulnerable web application which is exposed to the internet, it has a static IP, it's exposed by a load balancer, and then it's running a, log, a vulnerable log4j version. Let's say I set up my LDAP server, put my malicious Java class there, and then I also have another server with an Netcat listener. So let's say I send a malicious string um, to that vulnerable web application. So what log4j will do, it will parse that string uh, resolve the IP address and connect to the LDAP server. And then it will, of course, return. And then if I put a malicious Java class there, it will actually return with the Java class. Um, the web application with log4j, of course, will ex uh, execute that Java class. 
and then basically run the code that I actually put in the Java class file. And then, for example, if it was a reverse shell, it will, of course, connect to my other machine and then run that reverse shell. And then basically, after that, I can do basically whatever I want. So why is it so powerful? So it's like very easy to exploit. Like you can just pass that string um, to an application with your domain that you actually set up, and then basically uh, you can run like arbitrary code. So I'm not a Java developer, but when I was talking to my friends, it's basically almost everywhere. So if you are using Java, probably um, you are going to use that loading library. And then yeah, let me know if I missed anything. So what can detection and the response team can do, like in this case, or for example, security teams? Of course, they would need to um, identify and then patch these systems, but it will take a very long time. And then until that patching is completed, um, they would need to answer questions like, how can we detect that actually the software is unpatched? Or for example, if it's unpatched, like how can we make sure that our Kubernetes workloads and then servers are running safe. And then if they are not safe, like how can we detect if we have been compromised? So to be able to do that, we would need like a low overhead and real-time solution which would provide observability into our Kubernetes workloads. And then it needs to be dynamic. So that's where basically eBPF comes into the picture. Okay, great. Hi, good morning. So I have about 10 or 15 minutes and I'm gonna uh, try to convince you that BPF is the right technology for this problem. Um, and then hopefully I can convince you of that here very quickly. Um, and then we'll look about how to build up the right infrastructure to detect these kinds of CVEs in your cluster, all right? So first, I guess if you don't know what BPF is, um, there's been a few talks about it, but I'd give you this like the quick high level overview, right? Um, what does it do? Primarily, we can extend the Linux kernel, right? So previously, before we had BPF, if you were a kernel developer like myself, what you had to do is write some kernel code, submit it to the kernel community, get that patch in, and then you had to wait a long time, right? Because that code has to get upstream, and then it has to get into the vendor, and then your vendor might take a couple years, and then by the time your patch is there doing the stuff you want to do, uh, it's unlikely many people care anymore, and you might be off doing something else. So BPF gives you that ability to write some C code. It has some restraints, of course, because it needs to be safe when it's put into the kernel. The kernel can't crash or can't run your code forever and forget about the rest of the jobs that are on the scheduler and so on. But the, um, the BPF core will ensure those properties for you. Um, you write your little C program. Um, and you load it into the kernel, and you've basically extended the kernel at this point. What's nice is you can hook almost anywhere in the kernel. Um, most functions in the kernel can be hooked. If you're in the networking space, we have some performant hooks. If you're in um, the security space, we have some LSM hooks, which are security hooks at sort of well-known security checkpoints in the kernel. So that's BPF in a nutshell. Um, the other two nice properties for this particular problem that we're looking at are it's uh, minimally invasive, meaning it's fairly performant, right? It's basically taking an extra function call when you're in the kernel, right? And so you can imagine like the TCP stack with everything it's doing, one extra function call is going to be minimally noticeable. And then the other thing is it's dynamic. And this is quite useful when you have big clusters, mini clusters maybe, maybe you have 10,000 plus nodes, and you want to roll out an update to your BPF program to recognize a new CVE. So um, you can do this and then you can swap the BPF programs on the fly without having to reboot your nodes, sometimes without even having to restart any pod, your, your sort of management pod, and definitely without having to restart the pods that are your workloads, right? So everything keeps running and you have a seamless sort of update. Okay, so that's my BPF pitch. Um, what are some questions that our observability platform would like to ask, right? So we can say, what binaries are running in our system? And your system in this context can be your Kubernetes cluster, your virtual machines, your bare metal. If you're um, building up this observability platform, you want to know everything that's run in that cluster, right? This will let you know if things are being run that aren't expected. Um, you want to know what versions are being run, right? And not just the versions of the binaries, you want to know the versions of the libraries too, right? Because we know um, 
an old, uh, like a Docker pod, or, I'm sorry, a Kubernetes pod or something might be run, linking against an old version of OpenSSL. I want to know that. I want to make sure that my libraries are patched and up to date. I want to know all the network connections, right? Imagine um, a pod spins up, um, it's running happily for, I don't know, an hour or two, and then all of a sudden it starts doing a remote connection out to some S3 buckets or something, right? You might want to know that. It sounds a little suspicious. Um, TLS compliance is another big one that we see a lot. I want to know all of the TLS, if TLS is being used, if IPsec is being used, WireGuard, whatever. I want to get those encryption policies in place, and I want to make sure I can observe them at runtime and make some guarantees. So here's a list of things. Um, and of course, if you're someone who writes this software, your customers will probably tell you, I want to do it in real time or close to real time with microseconds and millisecond time bounds. I don't want you to use very much CPU, and I really don't like you to use a whole lot of memory either. You know? um, of course, if you're running a cluster, then you're on the other end of that, and you're telling uh, folks like me, please don't use too much CPU, please don't use too much memory, and um, please feed my pipeline in close to real time. So we have these constraints and a bunch of questions we'd like to ask. Um, due to limited time, you know, we're not going to go through every one of these. Um, so I highlighted a few, like, we're going to walk through, but then uh, Natalia will be able to show you in the demo here. Um, namely, what's running, what libraries are included, what network connections we're doing, and any file access, read, write, um, open. This gives us a good sort of baseline framework to build an observability platform. Um, we're going to base this off of Tetragon. Uh, Tetragon is under the Cilium umbrella of projects. It's the runtime observability and security piece. I'm the maintainer, uh, one of the maintainers at least. There's a whole bunch of people that work on this. Um, a few of them at isovalent, a few of them not at isovalent. Um, it's an open source project. If you go to a GitHub um, slash Cilium, it'll be under that umbrella. Um, basically what it does is it gives you a framework to start hooking into the kernel at all these various access points. Um, and then it gives you a mechanism to pull those out of the kernel once they've been filtered in the kernel, which is important because you're going to see in a couple of minutes that you could get a lot of data out of the kernel here if you wanted to. Um, and then also aggregated so that we get sort of smart metrics. We're not just dumping everything that the kernel ever does up to user space. We're collecting um, kind of heuristics, histograms, stats about the kernel, and then exporting what we want that's useful for us out to the agent, and then the agent then can interact with the world, so you have Prometheus metrics, logs, JSON logs, gRPC, a whole series of ways you can get this data off the system, depending on what sort of backend sim you're running. So let's dive in. First thing, we want to have some executable tracing. We want to see every process that runs in the system. Um, Tetragon provides that. It'll throw up a JSON event when something gets executed. Um, what you can see on the right there is some sort of a mock-up of what you might build from this, you know, an execution tree. You see Java, we see a lot of Java applications, and, and they're sort of interesting in the ways that they execute lots of children and, and how JVM works and stuff, so you want to trace all of that. Um, and you can see on the left is basically an out example of what a JSON output might, might include. I sort of slim this down. Um, Tetragon has the ability to sort of blow that structure up or shrink it down based on what information you're using. Um, in this case, an exec ID is interesting because it gives you a unique ID for an executable in a system, right? So anywhere in my cluster, I want to have a unique ID for that, ex that specific executable. Um, you might have a SHA-256. You know, binary names are not particularly secure. It's quite nice to say this is the digest of this binary that executed. Um, PID, CW, you see a lot of useful things in Linux here. There's a bunch of pod information that you can include, the container, the runtime the namespace, all of your normal Kubernetes metadata. And sort of interesting from this talk, for this talk is you also have the time, timestamp, so you, you can then push this into a database, and now you have what executed, a unique ID for it, and a time, which allows you to build a time slice, um, time series database, right? And so you can go back and forth in time and say what executed a month ago, what executed five minutes ago. You can do sort of more complex things like diffing the two, I want to see what my pod ran yesterday. I want to see what my pod ran today. Uh, maybe that's the empty set, or maybe there's some extra stuff in there that you should be paying attention to, OK? Um, on the, this uh, little flower picture here um, is just taking that mock-up, pulling in some real data from one of our test clusters, and, and kind of zooming out. And basically what you see is you know, every executable in our cluster on a graph. It looks good. Um, if you were to zoom in, 
and to each one of those, you would see each one of those clusters is actually a pod, um, because you can see how you can imagine pod executables are all related to each other, um, and then you can see their names and all their stuff in there if you were to click on them. Um, it's a fun, a fun picture uh, for a talk. Um, the next thing here, so we have executable traces now. Um, and I have five minutes, so that's good. So let's go with the next thing. We want to know about libraries, right? I want to know what I'm pulling in. And so here's an example. Again, you say you get the exec ID, which gives you back to the original parent of the pro or sorry, the original process, right? And you can say this process has these libraries associated with it. I know by the SHA that this library is one of my good libraries. I know by the SHA that this is one of my unpatched libraries. Again, it's a timestamp, so I can go forward and backwards in time and say, is this library patched? Is this library not patched? I know this is the digest of my patched library. I know this is the digest of my unpatched library. Let me go and look, for my, look in my runtime and see if I have anything running that is using an unpatched library. Right? Just... And when we think about um, how we pull this data out, right? So that's just the raw, the last slide was the raw. Um, Jason, we look at how we pull that out. There's a couple ways to do that. You can put it in a database. You can do queries over it, SQL queries. Um, the bottom is an example of a Splunk query. Um, if you've kind of done Splunk before, this should look familiar. You're giving yourself fields and names and doing a query over a database. Um, if, database if you don't want to store so much data, we can compress that down, and that's what the uh, metrics are at the top. It's just the binary name and the namespace. Um, in this particular example, it was something that was running on the host, so it doesn't have a pod, but if it was running in a pod, it would, um, a pod name and namespace would be there. Um, so we think about this now. We have everything that's executed. We have all of the libraries. We have a good sense of what our network is doing. The next, the next thing to sort of ask in this context is what are we connecting to, right? Like what are the network connections in the system? And um, that's what the network connectivity observability does. And we can monitor connects, listens, and accepts. What's interesting about this from, from a Tetragon standpoint versus, uh, say, a middle box or something running in the actual data networking data path is it's done at the socket level. So we see um, sockets, and we're not intercepting packets. Um, that has some advantages, especially when you think about listening um, sockets. You can imagine something opens a listening port. If you're in the actual data path, you wouldn't know about that until it actually packet was received or sent, right? Um, with something like Tetragon, where you're monitoring the runtime at the socket layer, you can say, just give me a list of everything that's listening to my cluster, right? And maybe, um, maybe there, that, that thing that's listening hasn't actually even been talked to yet, right? So there's no actual data on the thing. There's just a socket in your system. Uh, and the last next piece here we have is um, file integrity monitoring. Um, we call it FIM. This is the idea that now I know executables, I know my libraries, I know my network connections. Next thing I want to know is my files. You know, what am I opening, what am I reading, what am I writing? Um, this one is particularly interesting because when you build a system, and maybe your first attempt at this would be, let me just monitor all of the sys open, sys writes, sys reads, or something like this. Um, and you'll quickly realize that a Linux system does a lot of stuff with files, right? Everything is a file open, close, read, write, and you'll very quickly um, spam your, your back end, most likely. Depending on what you have in that pipeline, but your sim, um, we're just gonna get a lot of file data. Um, so one of the nice things about Tetragon, then, is you can build these filters in, which you see here on the bottom. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do those. Um, we have equality tests, substrings, and so on. But the basic idea is you can say, I wanna only monitor files in this directory, or I wanna monitor just a specific file and for a specific operation, maybe just writes. I don't care if you read it. Etsy password, for example, is a, as maybe an example of this where lots and lots of stuff will read Etsy password, right? Probably very few things should be writing to Etsy password. You know, um, SSH keys are another example, right? If, you, um, if your pods are writing to SSH keys, maybe that's not expected. Host file system, for example, is another one on a pod. Maybe it's okay to read the host file system, but you probably don't want your pods to be writing to the host file system. And those are the kind of policies you can put in Tetragon that then get loaded down into the kernel so that you, we get this low overhead property, right? And we also use less memory in the data stream because we're compressing only to events that you really, really care about. Um, 
finally, the, the kind of the last piece I want to mention is we can enforce things in Tetragon. This allows you to say, I want to, um, when I see this particular event, maybe it's that write to Etsy password, I want to stop the action, kill the process, freeze the pod. This allows an operator to come back later and um, figure it out. And the, the key for Tetragon's point of view is that it's done in line with the kernel. So the event happens while the call is being made into the kernel. We block that call and stop it from running in the kernel and then go back and do the action. And this way, um, versus a model where we just generate the event and we're to do it from user space, um, you know, if you're right to Etsy password, we want to make sure that that right doesn't actually happen um, versus sort of an async system, system where it would, you would see the, the right could happen and then you could stop the pod, which would be um, kind of after the action happened. Um, just to go back to sort of a little bit of performance, this is a benchmark that we have in the, in the repo, so you can run it if you'd like. Um, the time doesn't particularly matter, but basically what we're showing is that let's compile the kernel a whole bunch, which is interesting as a stress test because you're gonna create a lot of files, open and close a lot of files, you're gonna execute a lot of things. And basically what you can see there is for, for um, if you do proper, uh, the top one is just the base system doing all the library loads and executables. You can see very, you know, less than 5% overhead. Um, if you do a syscall monitoring, less than 10% overhead, and that 23% is what I said you probably don't want to do. That's what, a good example of something that may not be good, is if you monitor every file read and write in a system. So that's sort of like the worst case uh, thing. We don't actually use that policy in production. Um, but it, it, it sort of highlights the need to do in-kernel filtering and in-kernel aggregation, okay? So these are the things we've talked about. Right here, I'm not gonna go through them again, but it's a nice summary. Um, and then Natalia's gonna walk you through this workflow flow here, determine if we've been exploited, and um, use Tetragon to, to detect that. Go ahead. Cool, so let's dive into a quick demo. I will be very quick because we don't have so much time. So for like a test environment, I'm going to use like a GK cluster, very easy. It has one node, it's Ubuntu uh, 22.04.1 LTS. It's running a 5.15 kernel version. Um, on that road, uh, Tetragon is running, uh, running actually as a daemon set, and I have the vulnerable web application as a pod, like Java web app pod, and then it's running on the tenant jobs namespace. So I also have the LDAP server where I put the malicious Java class file and the netcat listener on that same node. So what we will see, we will see um, the exploitation of the web application. So I'm just gonna send a well-crafted string and then basically look for JV or parse that and then um, the Java class file will execute actually a reverse shell that the netcat listener is going to pick up. And then from that reverse shell, I'm just trying to list some environment variables and then read sensitive files. So this is how it looks like. Um, Tetragon can run, of course, on a multiple node cluster. Right now I'm just using like one node and then it's uh, running as a daemon set. And then as we mentioned, we are observing like a process execution, network connections, and then sensitive files. So all these events are actually exported like as a JSON event, and then it contains, for example, Kubernetes identity of our metadata, um, the process visibility information, network connection information, DNS of our metadata, and then for further investigation, you could actually um, import that to a CM system like Elasticsearch, Splunk, or S3 for later invest incident investigation, or for quick demos, um, you can actually use um, our CLI, which actually parses these um, events. So this is how it looks like. I have the uh, Java Web App Pod on the tenant jobs namespace. It has like an external IP that I, uh, that I can open from the browser. And then I have the LDAP server and then the Netcat listener. So let me just switch to the terminal uh, very quickly. So I can actually um, see if the Java Web App Pod is running. We see that it's up and running, and then I can actually open it from the browser, so this is how it looks like. And then this is on the bottom terminal, and then I can actually uh, set up the LDAP server on the top. Um, so let me just do that. So 
So let's take a moment to appreciate like what's actually written here. Um, here, I actually set up the LDAP server, and then I created the malicious Java class file, and then I put that on the server. And then it actually created a string that I actually can paste into the browser, and then which will trigger the exploit. So I took this POC from a GitHub repository. It co it's Cosmere Lock for Shell POC, very good for like um, testing purposes. So let me just start the um, Netcat listener on the middle. And now let me just start to observe the events from Tetragon. All right, um, let me just um, paste a string. And now I can say like, welcome to Amsterdam. Click on login. All right, so what we can see here on the top, I clicked twice on the login, so we will see the execution twice. So it actually connected to the LDAP server. We can see that the execution was successful. It returned with 200. We can see that the exploit.class was actually downloaded. We can see the connection that was received on the netcat listener. So this is actually the reverse that was executed by the Java class file. And now let's take a look at to the Tetragon events. So what we can see here is actually um, the connect event. We can actually see that um, there was a connection to, from the Java web app pod on the tenant jobs namespace. It reached out to the LDAP server. And then what's interesting, we, on the close event, we actually do statistics. So we can see that there was 1,600 uh, uh, bytes downloaded, with, which is actually um, the Java class file. We can also see the Kubernetes identity of our information. So we have an idea like where this uh, external connection was coming from. And then what's also interesting, this is the BNSH, the reverse, the, the shell execution. Um, so we could pick that up as well. So let me just list some environment variables so we can actually see that we are inside the Java web app pod. And then we can see the process execution as well as the exit event. And I can just read like ec password as an example. And then we could see, for example, that there was an execution event, and then an exit, exit event, and then open and um, close event on EC password. All right. Um, let me just go back. Great. So how, for example, a security team could use that like in like in a real world scenario. So you could export those JSON events into a CM system, and then you could create signatures, for example, late process execution. Um, so you would know, for example, like no external connection um, should have reached out from the Java application five minutes after the container has started. That's super malicious. Or for example, there should be never, there should be no shell execution, um, or the Java application should have never shelled out five minutes after the container started. So two quick examples. I will show a dashboard later on. So this is, for example, a Splunk signature for late process execution. So this would pick up, for example, the external reach out from the Java application and actually the shell as well. And then this is the Splunk query for shell execution. Um, this would, for example, pick up like malicious keep catalog so for example, if you have a workload and then you keep catalogs into it or someone else in your team, that's also something that we should consider. All right, so I actually, I prepared a, a dashboard. So what we can see here on the top, like um, there is a Java web app container started, and then five minutes later, there was just like a um, external reach out, which downloaded 1,600 um, bytes. And then if we take a look at and start to investigate, we see like, okay, this was the Java Web App pod from the Tenant Jobs namespace. 
And then we can see like, okay, it was the GRE being Java binary as a parent process. And then we can see that, okay, it's actually, actually executed a shell. And then on the bottom, we can actually see like what other processes were executed by that shell. Like, okay, there was an EC password read, and there was, for example, a write, or we can see like there was some listing to the existing directories. And then as a last step for like um, prevention, we should apply least privileged, least privileged principle for network connection. Um, so allow, allow only the network connections that your application needs and basically no more. So for this, uh, we would take advantage of the Cilium network policies and basically two features. The first is the DNS-based policies, which kind of allows traffic based on DNS names instead of like IPs and insiders. So you can say like, my application should communicate to only api.twitter.com and then nothing else. And then the second feature is basically deny policies. It's also like a Cilium network policy feature, which defines a set of destinations that will be um, denied uh, by allows other network traffic. And then we can take advantage of the word concept, which defines like host on the internet. So there is a quick example, like how could we uh, prevent this? So the first Cilium network policies actually allows connections only to api.twitter.com. And then the second deny policy is actually um, denies connections to everything else. All right, so we are still on time and wrapping up. So what did we see today? We see like a very quick intro to log for shell as a 101. We see like why eBPF would be the optimal solution for it. I think John covered it pretty clearly. We saw a quick demo, like how could we pick that up with like an existing open source tools like Tetragon. And then we see like, for example, further detection and then prevention techniques like the late process execution or the shell execution in Splunk and then um, the prevention with network policies. Yeah, so if you're interested, like, how to contribute, yeah. Yeah, you want me to go? <laughs> so go to the GitHub repository, join Slack, um, use the tool, um, report bugs, create feature requests, um, add your use cases, improve documentation. Um, yeah, the, we have, like, a lot of uh, work across the layers of the stack, so it's not only BPF code, you can, like, uh, contribute regarding to Go code, Kubernetes, um, documentation, um, packaging, and so on. Um, yeah, and then we still have some time, so I would open it for Q&A, and yeah, thank you for coming. I think there's a question in the front here, if there's a mic anywhere. Hi, thank, oh. you for your, I think it's working. thank you for your presentation. I have a question. We have a couple of colleagues. We are currently trying an alpha feature of Kubernetes, which is called the snapshotting. So you can basically a snapshot, uh, uh, or, or you can take like a picture of the current state of your uh, container. You have the RAM, etc. Uh, here, uh, Tetragon is more for runtime. Can we imagine use Tetragon for uh, forensic analysis, a post-mortem forensic analysis? Yeah, so I, I think there's a, there's a couple efforts in this place that I, that I know about. Um, there's a, a group of folks that are working on doing it and, and plugging it into like their GitHub Actions, where they run the pod and they get a snapshot of like events you want to, to have. So like you want to know, what do I connect to? What files open? What executes? So they basically build a, a trace from that. And once you have the trace, um, you can basically take that trace and build a policy, kind of automate a policy from that and then enforce it, right? So that, that's one approach I know some people are working on now, um, kind of in the SBOM kind of space, very similar to an SBOM, but then enforced. Um, and then there's a, another a th idea that people are thinking about right now is like, if we publish well-known images, like uh, Nginx or SQL or Java, you know, whatever, pick your favorite thing, um, we could ship that with um, what we know it does, right? Like some things we just understand well enough to say these things are what execute because that's what we put in the entry point, you know? And so you could build that policy just as part of the image. 
um, package them together, and then when it gets deployed, you would automatically apply the policy behind it, or probably in front of it, actually, so you don't have a race, and then you would get this kind of property that you're looking for, sort of known image along with known policy that restricts it. Yeah. Good. Is there another question? Feel free Thank to. You. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. I'm, I'm looking into the lights. Are there any other yeah, questions? <laughs> if I take a couple steps back, I can see better. If not, come find us. I mean, I'm, I will be around today. Um, I'm either at the Cilium booth or the isovalent booth. Um, or if you want to just come on up and chat with us for a little bit, we'll be around for a little while. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot.